Hey everyone, happy Friday, Friday before 4th of July next week. Um, I'm Phil Hodgen and welcome to the Hodgen Law BC International Tax Lunch. We do this almost every month on the last Friday of the month at noon Pacific time. So this is live and we skip when things collide with filing deadlines, we skip that or collides with Christmas. Um, you can listen on, online as you're doing right now live or later we'll pop this thing up on YouTube and you can watch it at your leisure. But if you're hearing this now, you don't need to go watch it on YouTube because you're already watching it. This month's topic is the third in the series of FERPTA stuff that I'm doing. And it's all about trust structures as holding entities for US real property investments by US by non-residents. So let's launch into this. Um, I don't, the way the screen is configured, I don't see the chat field, so I can't answer chat in real time. Um, you can ping me after at, by email and ask me questions and you know, I'll do the best I can for you. So here we are, here's the session. Next month is fixing problems and then, you know, more. Anyway, six series and the table of contents. So what I'm going to talk about today, the types of trust structures that we're talking about, the important tax aspects and how you plan for it and how you understand how the tax stuff works. Estate, generation, skipping, blah, 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 blah. We'll hit them. Um, we'll end up with a very brief overview for some design decisions. I know that the bulk of the people on this call are probably going to be CPAs and enrolled agents. So you're not going to be drafting trusts, but I'll tell you what to look for. So let's start with what do I mean by trust structures and what are we going to talk about today? So here are all of the types of you know, the, the essential, the families of trust structures that you can have. Basically the blue ones are domestic, trusts and you can have revocable or irrevocable and the gray ones are foreign trusts and again a foreign trust can be revocable or irrevocable for my purposes today and for the rest of this hour i'm going to be talking about these two structures because this ends up to be what everybody uses you're either going to have a domestic irrevocable trust and almost always the trust is going to own a domestic LLC that's a disregarded entity. And the real estate asset is going to be owned by that domestic LLC. And this is mostly for entirely for administrative convenience. Again, the thing can be, it can be a domestic irrevocable trust. It can be a foreign irrevocable trust. And as you will see, as we get into the estate tax discussion, the reason that it's re irrevocable instead of revocable is because this is the feature that gives this structure protection against estate tax. If the settlor of the trust set, I'll use the word settlor as the person who creates and funds the trust. Um, if the settlor falls, falls over dead, there's no estate tax on the real estate asset here. So big, big, big picture introduction. Why, how, blah, blah, blah. So why would you choose a trust, specifically an irrevocable trust, as a holding vehicle for US real estate? Well, to prevent estate tax. That's primary number one reason. Well, how does that work? Well, estate tax works by taxing what a dead person, the decedent, owns at the moment of death. And the way this works is you figure out all the assets that the person owned at the moment of death, and that's called the gross estate. You take away some deductions and adjustments and BS like that, and you end up with the taxable estate and then taxable estate times tax rate equals tax. So how does a trust prevent estate tax? By making the gross estate zero. And I'll go into excruciating detail on that in a while so you understand exactly how and why that works. And now we say, why would the trust owned real estate not be included in the gross estate 
of the settlor. Settlor puts in a million dollars, the trust buys a million dollar piece of property. Um, why is that million dollar piece of re real estate exempt from the estate tax and not included in the settlor's gross estate? And the answer is because the way gross estate is defined is the decedent, the dead person, the settlor in my case, who fell over dead, has to have an interest in property. And there's a specific, which basically means you've got an economic right and economic ownership in this thing, in the property. And in a trust, at first blush, the settlor, the person who made them, gave the money to the trust, doesn't own the asset, but there's this thing in the, in the estate tax part of the code called reta retained interests. And so if you draft the trust wrong, then the settlor has a retained interest in the property of the trust and therefore there's a state tax. So how do you prevent this retained interest? And I'm putting that both in the inflection of my voice and in on the, on the slide here in air quotes, because it's a defined tax jargon thing. And how do you prevent it? By drafting the trust document correctly. So that's the big picture that we're working for. We are aiming first and foremost with the trust structure to prevent estate tax. So this irrevocable trust is the firewall against estate tax if the settlor dies. And frankly, if, the, you know, if one of the beneficiaries dies too, the estate tax does not apply to the trust assets. First things first, let's talk about the kind of person that we are dealing with. So this settlor, your non-resident client who comes in and says, I want to buy some US real estate, what kind of structure should I put it in? The question is, how do you know this person is a non-resident? Well, the definition of quotes, non-resident, close quotes, for estate and gift and generation skipping transfer tax, transfer taxes generally, is different from the definition for income tax purposes. So for income tax purposes, you know someone is a resident alien, meaning they're alien because they don't have a US passport, and resident because they either have a green card or they spent too many days in the United States that year, substantial presence test. The green card and the substantial presence do not matter for estate tax and for gift tax. Non-resident in the estate and gift and generation skipping transfer tax means domicile. So for those of you who are in California and have had an audit by the Franchise Tax Board where your client claims that he or she was living in a post office box in Reno and therefore doesn't have to pay state income tax, you know what domicile means. You know, where do you really truly live? Um, so for clarity here, I am going to refer to this person as a non-resident, non-citizen. They don't have a U.S. passport and they are not domiciled in the United States. And so that's what we're talking about for estate tax and gift tax and generation skipping tax purposes. Now, let's talk through the rules for why there is no estate tax. I'm gonna give you three different explanations depending on what you like. First is the cartoon version. Next will be with reference to form 706 NA, the non-resident alien, the non-resident, not non-resident alien, that's an income tax thing. See, I skipped over. Okay, the 706 NA, why they call it NA, who knows, but that's the estate tax return for a non-resident, non-citizen. So I'm gonna do cartoons, tax forms, and then law. So you'll have it all one way or another, we'll sort of get it. So here's the cartoon version. We have the person who creates the trust and gives some money to the irrevocable trust. The trust in my little cartoon could be foreign or domestic, it doesn't matter. The trust takes the money and buys some US real estate. Let's kill off the settlor and then we'll kill off the beneficiary and see if we have a state tax problem. So the settlor dies, what happens? The answer is this person does not have an interest in the US real estate owned in the irrevocable trust unless the settlor has a quotes retained interest 
under section 2036, 2037, 2038. So if we draft the trust document correctly to avoid giving the settlor a retained interest, then the settlor can die in peace and there's no estate tax problem. Let's look at the other side on the right, the beneficiary. So what is the beneficiary's exposure if the beneficiary dies or technically the beneficiary's estate and heirs? And there the answer is, the beneficiary does not have an interest in the property of the trust sufficient to make this the trust assets part of the gross estate unless the beneficiary has a general power of appointment. A jargony phrase, this is section 1040, uh, pardon me, 2041. And basically what it means in plain English is if the trust document gives the beneficiary the right to order the trustee to give him money, you know, hey, trustee, send me a thousand bucks, then that ability at any time to functionally write a check against the trust and put that check in your own pocket is a general power of appointment. So again, we draft the trust correctly to not give the beneficiary a general power of appointment. So let's just walk through this from the 706 NA. So Schedule A says what's in the gross estate of the decedent in the United States. So U.S. real estate would be one. So this is, this is my first example. What if the non-resident, non-citizen just owns the real estate directly? Schedule A, line one, U.S. real estate goes in there. The value of the U.S. real estate goes on the far right and subtotals down. And that's gross estate in the United States. And we'll talk about what in the United States means in a second. Then we take the gross estate from Schedule A and we drop down to Schedule B. And this is where you make adjustments from the gross value of everything the dead person owned and make subtractions and hoo-ha like that until you have the taxable estate. And then we'll take the taxable estate to the next slide and you'll see um, well, the slide after that, and you'll see what the tax result will be. So here we have the situation, line one, the assets in the United States are in line one. And then line two is the gross estate of the decedent worldwide. And one of the interesting features for estate tax against non-resident, non-citizens is what they are allowed to deduct from the gross estate in order to arrive at the taxable estate. So it looked further down on line five, where it says deduction for expenses, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you look at the instructions for form 706 NA, you'll see it tells you, if you want to take a deduction on line five, you have to report your worldwide assets on the estate tax return. And so in, in almost every scenario, it is a dumb move to do this. To give you an example, if you have a, an asset that's a million dollar real estate asset in the United States, so line one is a million bucks, and the dead non-resident non-citizens total net worth is 10 million. So 9 million of assets outside the United States, 1 million in the United States, 10 million gross estate. Um, the deduction that you are going to be allowed to take for administrative expenses and legal fees and all of that is going to be the ratio of U.S. assets over total assets in the gross estate, so a tenth. So if you have a $100,000 expense, administrative expense, you're only going to get a $10,000 deduction on line five for that. And I've never, well, I've only ever seen it in one scenario but otherwise the math just doesn't cook out because the tax deduction that you're going to get on line five is usually less than the cost of preparing the tax return and getting appraisals of all the foreign assets and blah, 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 blah. So in your, what you're going to see here is that almost always in one of these things, if you're doing a 706 NA for a non-resident, non-citizen who has US real estate, you're just going to be putting line one and you're going to be leaving line two blank. And so as a result, this is what's going to look and your, so your total gross estate 
for estate tax purposes is going to be line three, just the U.S. side of assets. And you total it down and the taxable estate is going to be on line nine. Again, the U.S. real estate assets. There are some slight variations on this, but um, yeah, this, this is what's going to work. And in my experience, the estate tax returns that we've done, the property has been free and clear. The variance happens a lot with mortgage property and whether the mortgage is recourse against the debtor or non-recourse. And that makes a difference for whether the gross estate can be reduced or not for non-resident alien. And this comes from, oh, must be 15 years ago, estate of Fung, F-U-N-G, where a non-resident had a apartment complex in Oakland and died and there was a mortgage on it. And the question was, is the, is the taxable estate going to be the full value fair market value of the real estate or just the equity. And in that case, it was a recourse mortgage and the tax court said um, full fair market value. So that's how it goes. Anyway, so we've got gross estate down to taxable estate. And then look what happens if we successfully interpose a trust. So instead of direct ownership, you have someone who owns this property through an irrevocable trust. So the first thing is, if we've been successful in avoiding retained interests, then nothing goes on line one. So the gross estate of the decedent settlor in the United States is zero, and that zero cascades all the way down until we have a taxable estate of zero. And it's highly predictable when you have zero times tax rate, you're going to have a an estate tax liability of zero. So mechanically, that's how it rolls out on the Form 706-NA. Now, because I know you love the code, let's talk through the code sections. And you can see why this happens. I mean, it's, it's, it's helpful to see how the estate tax return rolls through and how it calculates, but Let's look at the code behind what's happening on the estate tax return. So you start with the definition of a gross estate for a non-resident, non-citizen. So that's section 2103. And you can see, first things first, you can see that the estate tax liability for a non-resident, non-citizen is computed in a different way from a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident because the gross estate for one of those people, US citizen or resident is defined in 2031. Whereas here we say, okay, for a non-resident non-citizen, the gross estate is all the assets of the person died as defined by 2031, but only a subset of those. And that's the assets that are situated in the United States. And remember on schedule A, just a couple of slides ago, it was gross estate situated in the United States. And so this is, you're seeing that Schedule A is really Section 2103 embodied on a tax form. And the cool thing about tax forms is once you start to understand the code behind it, you can understand why each line is there. You know, and so Schedule A exists because Section 2103 exists. So Section 2103 defining the gross estate of the non-resident, non-citizen decedent said, first go to section 2031, which is the gross estate for everybody. Um, and so it says, the gross estate is by, you know, is determined by looking at everything in the estate tax rules, which is section 21, 2031 through 2046, yay. Um, and it means whatever, sit, wherever situated. So you start there. That's the gross estate for a citizen, remember? So like you and me, we fall over dead. This is what is in our gross estate. And then 2103, I mean, pardon me, 2031 says, um, you know, look at 2031 through 2046. So 2033 is there. You see that second one. And here is the essential. This is, this is where the angels dance on the head of a pin. Gross estate means property to the extent of the interest therein that the decedent held at the time of death. So what is property and what is interest? So U.S. real estate is going to be property, obviously. Um, 
U.S. real estate is going to be situated in the United States. You don't even have to understand the esoteric meaning of situated to understand that. But we have the property is owned by a trust and not the decedent directly. So the question comes down to that magic word, does the decedent have an interest in the real estate? So indirectly through the trust. And a retained interest, and now remember it's section 2103 said, go look at 2031, and 2031 said, go look at all the estate tax rules of 2031 through 2046. And so here we have retained interests, which are section 2036 through 2037, 2038. So these are going to apply to our non-resident, non-citizen. And these are situations where a decedent is treated as holding an interest in property that technically he or she does not own, but for estate tax purposes is included in the gross estate. So the game here, when you're looking at the idea of a trust as a holding vehicle that you're gonna set up from inception, or God forbid you have a dead client and you're looking at an estate tax return, and there is a trust owned piece of real estate, you are going to be looking for a retained interest somewhere, somehow, the way you read the trust, the decedent had retained an interest as defined by section 2036, 2037, 2038. And you will have one of these problems if you drafted the trust wrong, and you will not have these problems if you drafted the trust right for various definitions of you. So here are the clauses that you'll see. I've given the four types of retained interests here. And then at the bottom, just for kicks, this doesn't apply to the settlor. It applies to beneficiaries is the general power of appointment for somebody other than the settlor being taxed on the trust assets if that somebody else dies. So there are either economic interests in the trust or the trust assets, or there are control features that the settlor has retained. So, you know, a re retained interest in the income. So I put a million dollars into a trust and I, and the trust buys real estate and I reserve the right to go live in the real estate and use it for free. I've retained an interest in the trust. Um, 2037, capital. If there is a possibility, and it's esoterically defined and it's actually computed, um, that the capital or some of it will revert to me at some point in the future, I have a retained interest under section 2037. There's a threshold. If you can compute actuarially, the value of the reversion is under 5%, you're okay. But that's the concept. Somehow, principal is going to come back to the person who put the money in to the trust in the first place. Control. If the settlor has the control to designate who amongst a bunch of beneficiaries is going to get income or principal, then there's a control retained interest under 2036A2. 2038 is if the settlor has the power to revoke, amend, blah, 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 the trust document, then again, there's the implicit control is retained by the trustee, but pardon me, by the settlor. So this retained idea is going to be important. I'm going to talk about what that means in a second. I'm going to show you how typically we get around it. If you want to think about retained interests, it's always, think of it like this. It's a gift with strings attached. It's a gift with economic rights coming back in some direct or indirect fashion, or it's a gift to a trust with some control rights. So the, you know, Mr. Big wants to keep a, a hold of the steering wheel and send the money one way or the other, because you never know what your kids or grandkids are going to be up to. Maybe you want to cut them off. Um, so retained, that's what it is with strings attached. And you can either have the strings attached explicitly and you can read the trust document and you can see the settlor has retained control to do X or Y or Z. 
Or the settlor can retain these powers or these beneficial rights indirectly because the settlor can somehow control the actions of the trustee or we infer the, the fact that the settlor might have the power to control what the trustee does or the trustee is in the settlor's pocket or we pretend so, you know, obvious situation, close family members. They're going to do what the settlor wants. So the, the uh, 1995, you see the bottom bullet point, Rev Rule 1995-58. The typical thing that a settlor likes to retain is the ability to fire a trustee and replace the trustee with somebody else. And if the, trust, if the settlor can put in a new trustee that's too close and you know, deemed con controllable by the settlor, you know, related subordinate and that kind of game, then the settlor is going to be treated as having all of the powers that the trustee has. So if you do that wrong and the settlor could substitute himself, herself in as trustee, now holds the trustee powers, and then the trustee has the power to distribute income or principal in the trustee's discretion to all of the class of beneficiaries. Well, now the settlor is control, controls the right to designate who inherits what from the trust, right? Or if the settlor is one of the class of beneficiaries, the settlor wearing the hat of the trustee has the ability to put money in his or her own pocket and that's going to be bad. That's a retained interest in income or capital or both. So you have to watch very carefully at the power of the settlor to control who becomes the new trustee. And Rev Rule 95-58 basically says, if the settlor retains the right to remove and replace the trustee, but the replacement trustee has to be a quotes independent close quotes person as defined. So then all is well. So that's what we typically do. But let's look at say that that's an example. And Lord knows I've had a few trusts where it's been very difficult to get rid of a recalcitrant trustee. So you do want the power to fire somebody at will. Um, but that one is usually fairly easy to deal with. Let's look at this idea of retained. Remember that section 2036 through 2038 say a retained interest, not just an interest. So if the settlor has retained the right to receive income distributions from the trust, that's a retained interest. But what if that you have an independent trustee who has the full power to distribute to anybody in the class of beneficiaries, and the settlor happens to be one of the class of beneficiaries. In that case, the power has not been retained by the trustee, by the settlor, pardon me, but the settlor has granted this power to a trustee, a third party, who then makes the decision. So the the, the settlor has an interest as a beneficiary, but not a retained interest, and that's going to be safe. So what you will see here is a properly drafted irrevocable trust that grants a trustee discretionary power to distribute to a class of beneficiaries, including the settlor, is going to be fine and is not going to create a retained interest in the income or a reversionary interest in the capital of the trust. So that's, that's where you're going, you're going to be fine. And this is going to be the typical solution to the problem. So let's wrap up this estate tax discussion with the beneficiaries tax risk. You know, I hand waved at the section 2041 the general power of appointment. If a beneficiary has the power to direct the trustee to make a distribution to the beneficiary or to the beneficiary's estate, or the 
beneficiary, the holder of this power, has the ability to instruct the trustee to pay off one of the beneficiary's creditors or creditors of the estate, then this is called a general power of appointment. And if you have that, it's kind of like you have a check payable to you and you chose, you got it in December of 2023, but you didn't deposit it in the bank until January of 2024. Um, yeah, constructive receipt. You really had the money in December of 2023. And if the government came along and discovered this, they say, no, you had income recognition in 2023, not 2024, because it was just your choice to sit on the check for a month until January, the new tax year to cash the check. You know, and you're trying to game the tax year thing and, and defer the income. It's the same thing here. The beneficiary, if the beneficiary has one of these powers, can leave this money in the trust and not take it out directly. But that's the 100% of the control over whether there's a dollar bill in the beneficiary's pocket or the dollar bill is still in the trust is. 100% in the control of the beneficiary. So that's a general power of appointment. What you will typically see is what's called a limited power of appointment. And there will usually be an article in the trust document that grants a limited power of appointment to beneficiaries that says, you can exercise this power and direct the trustee to distribute money to any of these people you know, and they'll list a class and typically it's descendants or trusts for descendants or something like that to keep the money in the family. And that, that article will say, but you're not allowed to exercise this power to create a general power of appointment and you know, as defined in section 2441. So again, as long as you do this correctly, the beneficiary can fall over dead and then the next generation can take over and be the beneficiary of the trust and there's going to be no problem. So quickly summarizing here, if you have an irrevocable trust and you have no retained interests because you were careful when you drafted the trust document, then the assets in this trust are going to be permanently exempt from a state tax. Stepping way back a level and where you're going to see problems. If the cl you know, client wants to have cake and eat it too, this kind of thing, dot com. Um, and so what they're going to say is, I want to have all the tax benefits of no estate tax risk, but I want to dance as close to the line as possible for putting money back in my own pocket and having control over everything that happens in the trust as I can get without losing that tax. And the closer you dance to that line, and you can get pretty damn close, um, the more risk you have of accidentally screwing up and making retained interest. So if your client is saying, no, I'll just put it in there and the money's gone as far as I'm concerned and it'll never come back, I'm putting it into third-party hands, an independent trustee, all as well, you're going to have something that's fairly straightforward, easy to understand and bulletproof. But the, the more control, the more economic rights that the settler wants to retain, the more you're gonna to have to take great care in order to prevent a state tax. Now, I've just spent like half of the time talking about estate tax and I'm sorry, but that's the way it's gotta be because the trust structure is built for this purpose. Everything else is pretty vanilla after we come to it, but I wanted to just get ridiculously nerd level for the estate tax, why it exists, why it works, and at least high level, some discussion of the drafting decisions that you make for a trust if you were going to use one of these things, you know, for instance, independent trustee, it's, et cetera. And the reason I'm doing this is, you know, so here comes a rant. Again, I said, I, I, my sense is the bulk of the people on this call and who, you know, watch every month and thank you for showing up um, are, are accountants and enrolled agents. And so as such, you don't have like, the hardcore exposure to the legal principles and the code and 
why does a trust behave the way a trust behaves and how does that all play out on the estate tax return? And I want you to really understand the foundational principles behind it, which is why yeah, I followed that trail from section 2103 defining the gross estate for a non-resident, non-deceit, non-resident, non-citizen to 2031, to 2033, to 2036, 27, 38. I mean, you, you need to understand those arcs. And then I had the 706 in NA in there to show you how it kind of looks. And, I, and I, I'm just saying to you that e, you got to put in the time. So we put in 30 minutes here. You just got to put in the time if you want to become God tier. And who doesn't want to be? So I'm encouraging you, you know, What's the, the, the Pink Floyd song, Time, right? It says, no one told you when to run. It's, you, know, you never heard the starting gun or something like that. I'm telling you, here is the starting gun. Put in the time. Just the, like, these sessions that I do typically take me 30 to 40 hours to put together. The, you know, people say, oh, Phil, you know so much. You're so smart. Yeah, just because I'm willing to suck it up longer than you are. And so I'm just telling you, just suck it up and put in the time because you are going to make your brain smarter. That brain is going to be portable and that brain can go anywhere and make a lot of money for you and you can feel good about it. So end of rant, just put in the time, put in the work. And now you know a little bit more about estate tax and there's more to be revealed when you dive deeper. Anyway, onward. Generation skipping transfer tax. Easy, 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 easy. The general rule here is that if you have a non-resident, non-citizen who made a gift to a trust and the gift was not subject to gift tax or the non-resident, non-citizen died and the assets went into a trust, if the transfer at death was not subject to U.S. estate tax, then all of the assets in that trust are forever and ever, amen, generation skipping transfer tax free. So you can put infinity money into a trust and not worry about generation skipping transfer tax for assets in that trust as one successive generation after another of beneficiaries dies. And this is usually the default path anyway, because you have a non-resident parent or grandparent who's funding a trust and the money will eventually flow downstream. So this is an important and useful and happy feature. And I've given you a site to a private letter ruling down there so you can go read that and see how it works, but it works. Gift tax, again, Easy peasy thing. There's no gift tax imposed when the non-resident, non-settler, non-citizen settlor puts money into a trust, whether foreign or domestic. Um, why is that? Because the U.S. estate, pardon me, the U.S. gift tax only applies to gifts by non-resident, non-citizen when the asset that is given is, quotes, situated within the United States. And situated within the United States is almost never true for one of these structures. I mean, you think money is going to be in a bank account outside the United States and without going into the CITES rules, which is the jargony way of, you know, the code defining where is an asset located, you know, cash outside the United States owned by a non-resident, non-citizen, for sure, it's going to be gift tax free. Therefore, you can easily fund this trust, whether domestic or foreign, with infinity money without being concerned with gift tax in the funding, as we normally are if you have a US citizen who is funding an irrevocable trust with a gift. You're worrying about unified credit and above that, the gift tax problem. So, that's it, this is going to be routinely something you're going to look at, but you can say, yep, I'm good to go. Just remember that if you're using a domestic trust, you have a 3520 problem. This is gifts from 
a non-resident alien to a U.S. person, you know, gifts above 100,000 are reportable on Form 3520, and that's going to apply to a domestic trust. So you file a 3520, I got a bunch of money from this, you know, signed trustee, done. Now, having gone through all of that, let's go to income taxation. I'm going to talk about capital gain because the, the same principles are going to apply if you have rental income. But for the most part, you're going to see these types of structures and these trusts, at least I do, primarily with personal use assets. Because as we talked last month about corporate structures and how corporate structures, you have a personal use of a corporate owned asset. Um, at some point, we're going to have some kind of imputed income problem. A trust has no such problem with one exception, which I'm going to talk about, which came by way of proposed regs that just were published in May. Okay. Intuitively, we all know that an irrevocable trust is either going to pay the income tax on its income, or it's going to do a pass through to the beneficiary and the beneficiary is gonna pay the tax. But why does this work? Well, let's look at the 1041. I'm gonna choose a domestic trust just to keep it simple. Um, and it's the, this, uh, just what, section 661, the distribution deduction. And that's on line 18. So you're, you're going to have a dollar for dollar deduction for anything that's distributed out to the beneficiary. So if the trust has $100,000 of capital gain and makes a distribution of that capital gain to the beneficiary, gives them a K-1, then the beneficiaries are going to file an income tax return, a 1040 or a 1040 NR, depending on whether the beneficiary is a resident or non-resident, report the $100,000 of capital gain and pay the tax. Have this little table here, which is going to summarize what we're going to see ahead of time. But we have two ideas here. A trust can either be a grantor trust, which means that all of the tax is always going to go to the domestic, to the grantor, or we're going to have, oh, it looks like the upper left quadrant, I've got domestic grantor, that should be foreign grantor, typo. Okay, um, so the, the grantor trust sends money upstream to the grantor trust, to the grantor. Grantor rules are income tax only, section 671 through 679. And basically, if you toggle one of those rules, then the income of the trust is taxed to the grantor, who is also the settlor for our discussion of estate tax, estate tax purposes. So if we have a grantor trust, then income will always be taxed to that person, not to the trust and not to the beneficiaries. And if it's a domestic trust, of course, the FERPTA rules, section 897 don't apply. It's just, you got a domestic trust, it has domestic source capital gain, pay the tax, you know? shunted off to the domestic grant, to the grantor, foreign or domestic, but in our case, foreign. With a foreign trust, this is not part of the game here, but the foreign, the grantor trust rules are much more limited for when a foreign person can be a grantor of a grantor trust, meaning taxable on the trust's income. Either has to be the sole lifetime beneficiary or has to have a power to revoke. And we know we don't want to have power to revoke because that's a retained interest. But the non-grantor trust is the game that you're going to be playing all the time, at least in my experience. I mean, so capital gain is going to be included in the taxable income first of the non-grantor trust because that's the way it works. And then, you know, section 997A, we're in the top right quadrant doesn't apply because it's domestic taxpayer and FERPTA only applies to sales by non-residents and foreign corporations. When you have a foreign trust, capital gain again is going to be taxable to the foreign non-grantor trust, but again, 
And, and this time 897 will apply and I'll show you why in a second. Um, and, off, and off we'll go. So again, at a first step, you're going to assume that if it's a non-grantor trust, the trust itself is going to pay the tax on the capital gain. And then the trustee is going to decide whether to do a distribution through to the beneficiaries or not. So here's a little slide. And I'm now going to detail from that um, little two by two box. So grantor trusts, which you know about. And the main thing to do here is understand that the way that FERPTA is set up section 897 for treating it as taxable gain and the FERPTA withholding rules say that if you have a grantor trust, the non-resident alien grantor is the real taxpayer and therefore the gain is taxed to that person and you treat the withholding as done by that person that we ignore the trust. Here is the key to understanding FERPTA. So section 897A, which is the thing that makes sale of US real property subject to US tax, the capital gain, applies only to non-resident alien individuals or foreign corporations. It doesn't say anything about foreign non-grant or trusts. But the key to it here is section 641B that says if you have a trust, a foreign trust specifically treated as a non-resident alien individual who is never present in the United States. And so in an indirect fashion, as is so often done in the Internal Revenue Code, we redefine the kind of taxpayer you really have, a foreign non-grant or trust, as a make-pretend non-resident alien individual. And then once we have a make-pretend non-resident alien individual, we can determine the tax results under section 897A. And that's why when you have a sale of a US real property interest by a foreign non grantor trusts, 897A is going to kick in. So there you go, repeating it. I'm wordy on these slides, just, you know, break the fourth wall here because I have endless numbers of slides on my computer and I look at them later and they're just sort of summaries or just a few words because that's the way you're supposed to do slides. And I said, what the hell happened here? Well, how did that person come to that conclusion? And I try to be wordy here. So it's, you go back to this a year later, you can kind of figure out what's going on. And if it gets a little bit excessively wordy, sorry. Okay. So we know that we have the foreign non grantor trust treated like a non-resident alien individual. The trust is allowed to use the distribution deduction, which is section 6061A. And if it, that happens, then the beneficiary is taxed on the income distributed. That's 662A, right? And the, classific the characterization of the income item flows through from the trust to the beneficiary as part of the distribution deduction, which is 662B, which this is how we now extract an item of capital gain, typically long-term capital gain out of a non-grantor trust and drop it onto the individual tax return of the beneficiary. Again, 1040 or 1040NR depending. So, and so now we say, how does Section 897, make sure that this gain gets taxed. Answer is Section 897A1 explicitly says gain from sale of US real property interest by a non resident alien individual is going to be taxed. And we have an item of capital gain from sale of a US real property interest on a tax return for a non resident alien individual taxable. So following that long chain through all the way, we now understand that this gain is going to be taxable on the tax return. Net investment income tax. Who pays? First things first, remember that net investment income tax, the tax, the income definition is different than it is for normal income tax. But capital gain is definitely net investment income. Non-resident alien individuals 
are exempt from net investment income tax. Foreign non-grant or trusts are exempt from non-net investment income tax, which makes sense. Remember that foreign non-grant or trusts are gonna be treated as a non-resident alien individual who never sets foot in the United States. So the o- when we're talking about trust decisions, the only trust structure that is potentially at risk is a domestic trust, because a domestic trust is only taxable on net investment income if it's not distributed to the beneficiary. So undistributed net investment income. And here I've got my little fancy dancy table here and the the red box shows you the only place of risk where you're going to have the potential for net investment income tax is if you have a domestic non-grant or trust holding this real estate and this real estate is sold with the capital gain and the trust does not distribute the capital gain to the beneficiaries. Then the trust has undistributed net investment income, net investment income tax applies. Got cash in the bank, but you have 3.8% less cash than you used to have. But on the other hand, if the domestic trust distributes that income, that capital gain to the non-resident alien beneficiary and the character flows through to the non-resident alien beneficiary, now you have a non-resident alien that has the capital gain, which is net investment income, but a non-resident alien is exempt from the non-net investment income tax. So the moral of the story is you can't screw up if you have a foreign non-grant or trust. If you have a domestic non-grant or trust, you have to be careful in the year of distribution of sale of the real estate to make a distribution to the beneficiaries so that you can get the capital gain out of the domestic trust. So it's now distributed into the hands of a non-resident alien beneficiary and the non-resident alien beneficiary does not have to pay that extra 3.8% magic tax that we have. Some design decisions. Let's just wrap up with some design decisions, high level uh, for what I think you should be looking at. First things first, no revocable, no amendable. So the settlor doesn't have the power to change things. Quite often you'll see these trusts where the beneficiaries, well, not the beneficiaries, pardon me, the trustees will have the ability to make some limited amendments to the trust. The trustees may have the power to add or delete beneficiaries. Um, the You might have a third party called a protector or a guardian or whatever you want to use, which is an in, yet another independent person, typically a friend of the settlor, but not under the settlor's control, will have the power to revoke, amend, you know, order the trustee around and stuff like that. The key thing is do not give the, benefit, the settlor the power to revoke or amend. The next thing, choose a domestic trust. So this is my bias. Um, And you just heard me talk about the net investment income tax where you really can't screw up if you have a foreign non-grant or trust, but a domestic non-grant or trust, you can screw up with the net to the extent of the net investment income tax. Why do I like a domestic trust better? First things first, it's domestic seller. So you don't have FERP to withholding when the property is sold. You don't have the 15%, which is great. Um, the tax results are going to be the same. Estate tax, they protect, generation skipping transfer tax, gift tax, all of it's going to be the same. The major differences are going to be the 3520 reporting requirement if a domestic non-grant or trust is used. And then this thing, 643I, which in my opinion, you know, if you're trying to avoid creating landmines for future you to step on, this is the one you should be looking at. So free or discounted use of assets that are owned by a foreign trust by a U.S. person are going to be treated as a deemed distribution. As of May 24, 2024, and I've given you that, we have new proposed regulations and explicitly, if again, you screw things up, 
this deemed distribution, for, I use the condo in Vail for free, and I'm a US beneficiary of the trust, will have the capability of creating taxable income for that beneficiary. And I see this, and nobody's going to pay attention to it, but it's going to be a deemed distribution that's going to attract a form 3520 penalty, 35% of the de deemed distribution, and it's going to be a mess. So here in the, I'm now going to go through the proposed regulations. The proposed regulations say if a benefit, U.S. beneficiary or a U.S. person related to a U.S. beneficiary uses trust-owned property for free, that's going to be what they call a Section 643I distribution, which is their jargon for let's pretend that there, a distribution actually happened. So remember, U.S. beneficiary, I'm the beneficiary of a trust along with a bunch of non-residents, I'm a U.S. beneficiary, or a person related to a U.S. beneficiary. So whoever is related to me uses the, the trust assets, the condo and veil, that's a distribution to me. Who is related? Well, you look at the same old rules we look at for a lot of times, so 267C and um, 707B. So 267C4, what's family? Family is brothers, sisters, spouse, ancestors, and lineal descendants. So basically up and down the, the um, bloodline. But look at that extra added on from the proposed regs. Spouses of all of those people. So how do you know you, you've got a grandchild who is married and you know, the wife of the grandchild gets the key to the condo and veil and goes there for a week to have fun. And you know nothing about it. And two years later, this comes to light, deemed distribution to you. What's the weekly rental value of that thing? Thank you very much. Why didn't you file a 3520? Why didn't you report it as income and stuff like that? So the risk here is that people unknown to you, I mean, you'll know who they are because you know who your family members are, but they're using the property without your knowledge. The rental value is the deemed distribution amount. The tax treatment, um, in a while I'm going to be doing a discussion of accumulation distributions in the trust sequence coming up later this year. When a distribution happens from a trust, it's either the accumulation, the actual method. So you look at the trust accounting and you treat it as a distribution of income to the extent of DNI or UNI. Otherwise, it's a distribution of capital. Well, great. If you can't qualify for that, and there's the actual one, I'm speeding up because I'm running late. Um, if you cannot qualify for that, and it's easy to not qualify for that, then you use the default method and look at the default method. So this deemed distribution is either going to be ordinary income to you or it's going to be an accumulation distribution to you, which is also taxable, but taxable at a higher rate. Note what's not here. It's not treated as a distribution of capital. So that week or two of use by someone distant relative of yours of that condo and veil is going to be taxable income to you no matter what. So my conclusion is if you have a US beneficiaries, please use a domestic trust, just you're gonna make things a lot simpler for yourself. Grantor, non-grantor, 90% um, of the time we use non-grantor trust, just, that's the way it shakes out because it's physically impossible to satisfy the client's desires for the trust structure and make it a grantor trust structure. So. I think you should expect to use a non-grantor trust. Grantor trust is fine, you know, just as long as everybody under understands who's paying the tax. And the final, of course, is watch out for retained interests. And this is just when your client wants to have cake and eat it too, and wants to have some kind of control, that's when you're gonna start to wake up. Well, there we are. Conclusion is non-grantor trusts, I like them. They work really well, especially for personal use assets. They work fine for investment assets too, because they're just gonna flow income straight through to an individual tax return. Um, and I like domestic more than I like foreign non grantor trusts because there's less opportunities for future Phil to be sad because he screwed something up. 
So with that, that's trusts. And next month, we're going to be fixing problems. And so this is going to be a familiar event in your life. I suspect people come in and say, you know, I fell underneath the spell of a broker that I met in a flower shop and she sold me this glorious house and it's in my name. What do I do now? I just realized that I have an estate tax problem. And we're going to talk about how you get from a suboptimal holding structure that has tax problems into an optimal holding structure. So that's going to be next month. And until then, happy 4th of July. Send me an email if you have questions and see you in July. Bye.